Hi. Today we're discussing a topic, the knowledge of God, part two. I want to take a look at some principles dealing with the knowledge of God. The first principle the scripture illustrates <clears throat> is that God is described as a God of knowledge. He makes judgments based on his knowledge. Turn to 1 Samuel, 2nd chapter, verses 1 to 3. As you're turning, we have a woman praying to the Lord. Her name is Hannah. She's the mother of, of the first judge, actually, of uh, Israel, a man named Sam. She named Samuel. And she's thanking the Lord because she previously was childless. And the Lord gave her a son, and she dedicated him to the Lord, and she this point, praying a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord. And in 1 Samuel, <clears throat> second chapter, verses 1 to 3, we see the sum total of her prayer, which is directed by the Holy Spirit. Anna prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. There is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him, actions are weighed. So God is a God of knowledge. And he performs based off of his great knowledge. Scripture teaches, in Christ, God imparts his eternal knowledge. First in the stages of understanding, then when we reach eternity in its fullness. Knowledge comes through his word. From the 1 Corinthians, 13th chapter, verse 12. So we are inheritors of the vast knowledge of God in Christ. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. <coughs> Paul makes a statement. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now <clears throat> the word know here means to discern, to comprehend. What Paul is saying, we receive knowledge from God. The knowledge comes in two ways, perception, discernment, and then understanding of what we have perceived, what we have discerned. We do that in part now because we are limited. We are in bodies that have not been redeemed. We're in a fallen world. But the knowledge that God will impart to us in this state, in, this, in the place that we are at now, is tremendous. But as tremendous as it is, it's only a part of what God will impart to us when we stand in his presence. Is then will I know as I am known. In other words, is, <clears throat> you will notice what Paul says. He says, for now we see through a glass darkly. He's talking about the whole body, everyone that has the Holy Spirit, the spirit of knowledge is dwelling in them. We all have the capacity to see. What we're seeing is not in its fullness, but we are able to see. Then he goes on, and notice where he changes. He says, now I know in part, but then 
shall I know, even as I also am known. What is he saying here? He's saying, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm going to progress until I reach a stage in which I can achieve the fullness of the knowledge of God. Yes, Don. Well, this is, for now, for now we, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, he's talking about face to face with Christ. Yes, returning. yes. In a glorified state, you'll be on level equality in the presence of God. <laughs> The group that we call the Prototokis, which means the firstborn, those that have progressed and taken advantage of what is available or receive the fullness of what God has to offer. To the degree to which we pursue the knowledge of God in this life, that's the degree to which we're going to be blessed, that's the degree to which we're going to be successful in this life. And in eternity, we will stand in his presence and receive the fullness of everything that he has to offer. All things, the scripture says. If you don't if you don't get it now, your eyes aren't going to be open now, it's going to be open when we get to eternity. Our eyes are open now so that we can begin to perceive and understand the knowledge of God, the knowledge that God imparts. Now we want to pursue some principles dealing with this. We said, Scripture teaches in Christ, God imparts his eternal knowledge first in stages of understanding. You start off as a babe. You don't start off in the highest degree of maturity because we couldn't deal with it. We couldn't handle it. So God gives us what we can receive. And as we receive, we are open to receive more and more on a higher and higher and higher perspective. And this is how we progress in Christ. Turn to Colossians, second chapter, verse 1 to 3. Colossians, second chapter, verse 1 to 3. As we begin to pursue the knowledge of God, we begin to understand the value of the knowledge of God, how precious it is. It's very demanding on the life that's going to pursue it. You pay a price to receive the knowledge of God, and the price equates to a sacrifice. You have to put in time. You have to put in effort. It's not just going to jump in your lap. It is something that needs to be pursued. Effort has to be made to receive it. But you will find, as you pursue it, as you receive it, as you comprehend the things of God, it, it becomes all worth it. And you hunger and you thirst for more and more knowledge. And the more knowledge you pursue, the more God is going to give you. Now, Colossians, second chapter, verse 1 to 3, we read, Why wouldn't that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh? Paul is writing about his concern for the churches. That in their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God imparts the treasures of his knowledge to anyone who will receive it in Christ. The more you pursue, the more God will give. Paul understands this. And he says, in God and in, in Christ are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now that's a statement that we cannot comprehend in this fullness where we are. In comparison, you can pursue one of two courses, the knowledge of the world or the knowledge of God. First and foremost, if you pursue the knowledge of the world, you're going to understand that the knowledge of the world is temporary. It doesn't last. It changes because the characteristics of this world are consistently changing. 
Look at science. Science is consistently rephrasing its principles, its belief, because it's pursuing things outside of the knowledge of God. And it has to consistently refine what it knows, because there are new and new things that are coming in to the bailiwick of those that are pursuing it, which alter what they already knew. So to pursue the knowledge of the world is to pursue a temporary course in which you're going to pursue change. Look at the detestable insult your intelligence called evolution. How that thing has changed from the time of its inception through Huxley and Darwin. Oh, they started things off with um, everything has undergone this radical evolution over millions of years. What are they saying now? They're saying, well, we determined that uh, things didn't happen uh, all at once, that evolution progresses in stages and jumps. They consistently are refining that insult to your intelligence because it's a house built on sand. They can't prove it. They can't even maintain it because the things that the, the principles that they go for in trying to justify it consistently change. All science changes, and uh, you'll find that uh, whether it's astrophysics, astronomy, they're consistently refining their comprehension. Science started off with arguing among itself with um, astrophysicists about the state of the universe. One group said, well, uh, the universe is constantly expanding. Another group said, well, the universe is uh, what they call steady state. Now they have string theory and consistently refining what they know about the universe because they're trying to do it apart from the knowledge of God. Can't not be done. That's why the scripture says science falsely so called. Pursue the knowledge of God and you have the foundation for all other things. Yes. Studying the universe and everything, and he started believing in God sure. because he couldn't, he couldn't prove anything, and it came to an end. All their beliefs and everything kept exactly. Your tail. Exactly, you're not making any progress. You're going in circles. That's a logical conclusion. You pursue science objectively, and you come to the conclusion: God is real. God exists. So what we find here. The scripture is teaching us to pursue the knowledge of God is to pursue the things of <clears throat> a changeless comprehension. Truth is the knowledge of God. The truth never changes. <clears throat> scripture teaches the Holy Spirit is consistently imparting the knowledge of God daily to the mind that is open to receive it. I'm going to repeat that. Scripture teaches the Holy Spirit is consistently imparting the knowledge of God daily to the mind that is open to receive it. The Holy Spirit will impart knowledge of life as it is, as it should be lived, as it should be pursued on a daily basis. Turn to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Verse 12. 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, verse 12. Then we're going to take a look at some examples of the knowledge of God. <clears throat> now we have received not the spirit of the world, it is the knowledge of the world. It doesn't come from the Holy Spirit. We receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. God's spirit imparts the knowledge of God so that we might know God, the things of God, the things that are important in life. You know, 99.9% .9 of the human race goes into eternity believing a lie. 
because they rejected God. You know, if you take a Buddha, a Buddhist, a Shinto, <clears throat> a Hindu, a Muslim, they comprise the major religions of the world, which are based off of a fallacious belief. They die believing that stuff, and they go into eternity totally ignorant of what's waiting for them there. Only the knowledge of God will prepare you for what's waiting for you when you transit this life. <clears throat> the word here again that we might know is to perceive and to understand. Turn to Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 16. We see some examples of what knowledge the Holy Spirit will impart to the mind that's open. Romans 6, verse 16. Know you not, the word know there is understand, the Paul is saying to the church at Rome, do you not understand that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, is servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The Holy Spirit will quicken the mind that's open to the knowledge of God to comprehend, to understand that Whoever it is that's an authority in your life, that is the authority that you're going to become a servant to. People that think that they are free to pursue the desires of the mind and of the flesh become servants to sin. They don't understand that there's a law that regulates Every aspect of life is called the law of sin and death. And we did, we've done lessons on that. The law of sin and death is a law of compensation, demanding payment. If you break that law, it demands payment for infractions. For people that are pursuing their own desires, which are running contrary to the will and the way of God, are consistently breaking the law of sin and death, and the Lord demands payment. If payment is not forthcoming, then the law of sin and death will render a curse in that life. Take a look around you at society. Society is rife with curses. You have homeless people that are floundering all over the place. You have rich people that are wiped out through emotional distress and, and um, health problems, and worries and frets and frustrations. All of it deals with curses that come into the life that is lived contrary to the harmony and the beauty and the glory of life as God designed it to be. This is telling us here, the Holy Spirit will quicken the saint when he's not going across the right path, that he's going to incur some problems, yeah? What could be the payment specifically to well, for a person that doesn't know the Lord, the only payment that they can make to justify the law of sin and death is to receive Christ as personal Savior. To receive Christ as personal Savior, they come into the born-again experience and immediately the demands of the law are met because Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, met the demands of the law. So anybody that's in Christ, the law basically is not making any demands. It's satisfying. Because Christ satisfied the demands of the law. The person outside of Christ has to receive Christ. It's the only way he can make justification for the debt to the law of sin and death. If he doesn't, then the law of sin and death is going to make demands on him after he leaves this life. He goes to hell. Torment region. Demand payment for the law that he broke while he was alive. Can't make that payment, so he's forever in eternity, being tormented. Yes? So, 
The person is living as righteous as they can, seek God in all things. Yeah. And they get sick. Mm -hmm. That could, I mean, that's not because they're living unrighteous. No. Because Paul went through that. Yeah. That has nothing to do with behavior, or at least in that particular case. You live in a fallen world. These bodies corrupted is subject to the things of corruption. Paul writes about them. But see, I'm where I live. I'm at a tough because <laughs> 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 that's not a good thing in the world. Because I've heard you say, you know, everybody's sick and you feel it coming on you and you rebuke it and you don't, you just deny it, you refuse it to accept it. Spiritually. But Spiritually. so that will manifest physically as well, so you don't get the physical. So when I'm going through shingle, with the shingles thing there, you know, it's not funny that I know that. It's not funny. I believe God's, I'm not sure, <laughs> you seem to not get my attention, but have me focus on something, have, have me learn something. Each person is unique. Each person goes through experiences. If you're in Christ, it's not as a result of anything you've done. I would suggest seeking the answer from God, the Holy Spirit. Now, it might be a situation because Christ paid for our illnesses and affliction. The scripture tells us, 1 Peter 2.24, by his stripes we were healed. But, by the same token, healing doesn't come, it's not going to pursue you. It's something you have to fight for because you have an enemy that's trying to rob you of it every chance he can. So it might be that you need to fight more. It might be that you need a higher level of a faith quotient to combat that level of affliction. I'm not saying that's so, I'm saying it's a possibility. Pray on it, the Holy Spirit will give you insight. Yes? No. But what the Lord expects is for each one of us to pursue the truth. The Lord expects each one of us to pursue the truth. What if sickness takes you out before you actually get to that point? It depends on your state of mind. In other words, would you have, would, when you got taken out, were you in a state of mind where you were willing to pursue truth? That's what God's going to look at. Motive. If a person has access to the Word of God, and willfully does not pursue it, then you have a choice. You can open your Bible, and you can uh, sit there and allow the Word of God to come forth, or there's a program on TV tonight, uh, Game of Thrones. I wonder what's happening with the little elf, or whatever it was that I saw last week. You make a choice. God holds us responsible for the choices we make. A person who's on the other side of the world that doesn't have access to the scripture, but wants the scripture, God will make it possible for him to begin to learn from some source the word of God. That will come to him. Here, where we have the word of God in abundance, God expects us to pursue it. God looks at motive. He looks at the heart. And that's where he makes his judgment. Yes. My mother was so convinced so is my grandma book of uh, the truth of Buddhism, the Buddhist principle, blah, 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 which actually is atheistic, well, humanitarian, that it does not give place to God or acknowledge his existence. Now, my question is, why is the Lord blaming or finding fault or punishing them if they buy into a wrong doctrine that so they are blind to knowledge of him and so I try <clears throat> to 
show them differently that they are so set in their doctrine as being right because they all their life have believed it. So why do we why does the Lord blame or call account to some people that are blind to knowledge of him and not choose him because they bought into something else? He just said it. They decided they would not choose him. But they didn't know. Well, they had the opportunity to know. In this country, there's no excuse. They determined that they would not know because they believe in what they know. And that's why it's called blindness. You know, yeah, but it's also a decision that a person makes. You know, God does not mind us testing other religions. You become a Christian, and you are centered in the Word of God, grounded in the Word of God, God has no problem with you investigating the religion of Islam or Buddhism or any other religion because he knows that you're going to come into a, an understanding that that thing is not true. He is a God of love. Yes, he and is. Mercy and grace. Yes, he is. But he holds us responsible for our decision. He holds us responsible for our decision. If you present the gospel to anybody, they're faced with a decision. Now, from what you just said, it's not that they are blinded in understanding. It's that they made a decision they will not investigate objectively what you're presenting to them. That's willful rejection. That's what God holds them responsible for. Well, a child would do the wrong thing because he's a child. They are sort of like that. <laughs> no, they're adults because a child does not really know. A child is still under the authority of its parents. The parent makes a decision for the child. But when you reach a point where you know that God holds you responsible, yeah. Does religion keep one name and Christ keep one name? Yes. Yes. So where do we find that high line between? I was faced with the death of my brother when I was 64. And my brother's position was to be cremated. Mm -hmm. So that's what I had done. Okay. We had friends out here from the Church of Christ, the members of the Church of Christ. They turned on me like I killed him because I honored his wishes. However, since the Church of Christ does not believe in that, I'm not sure of what I did wrong, but they don't even speak to me. I'm going out of one of me and church of Christ, totally love you until I had his body cremated. I'm confused. Well, that's a religious belief. Church of Christ doesn't believe in musical instruments either. You're a piano exactly. player. Well, so you would not be welcomed wholeheartedly into their presence playing your piano. Oh, the pastor himself stepped to me when I was visiting my mother on Mother's Day. He stepped to me like he was my brother, and I was going to go. Right in church. Yeah. Uh, the Church of Christ believes if you're not baptized in their baptism tank, and uh, you're not really saved. They believe a whole lot of stuff which is contrary to Scripture. Right. But contrary to Scripture. So you, you, you were wasting your time going through what their opinion of you is. From a scriptural perspective, they're in the wrong. And, and one day, time one day, yeah, they're going to have to. One day, they're going to have to answer for the ignorance that they believed in as true. <clears throat> Again, God holds us responsible for the decisions we make. God's word is not found. Okay, but then in that particular scenario. Was my brother wrong for wanting to be cremated, or was I wrong for going to be able to do it? I'm going to get cremated. Cremation has nothing to do with your salvation, your life in Christ, absolutely nothing. Well, you, know, you should ask him what he based it on. Okay. What scripture does he look at to base on 
salvation having to do with what happens to your body after you die. If you want to get buried, that's fine. If you want to get cremated, that's fine. Because the body is going to go in the same place if, if, no matter what you do to it. It's going to go back to its elements. People spend their time majoring on the minors at the exclusion of truth. Jesus talked about that dealing with the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, you're straining a gnat at a gnat and you swallow a camel. You're nitpicking the things that are absolutely insignificant from God's perspective. Why it's so important for us to stay in the world. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't disrespecting No, him. no, no. But he frightened me in front of his congregation like, I'm the rich, I'm done, he's the great I am. Yeah. That's going to assemble the parts back together at the rapture, and we will enjoy a glorification for eternity. So this, this other stuff, is, it's the thinking of men, again, knowledge of the world, not the knowledge of God. This is why it's so important for us to get the mindset of Christ. Matter of fact, let's go on to some more principles here. Turn to Romans, the seventh chapter, verse 18. Romans 7, verse 18. Paul makes a statement, for I know. What does that mean? I understand. I perceive. I perceive. I understand. I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but I have to perform that which was good, I find that. So Paul, under the <coughs> aegis of the Holy Spirit, is receiving knowledge true knowledge of his state, of his relationship to God, of his relationship to the world, the things that are important, all come about as perception and understanding. <clears throat> Paul is saying, I know in me. So Paul will never experience a situation where he believes himself to be infallible and sinless, like some Christians think. I remember as a little boy, uh, there was a preacher come in our neighborhood named um, Pastor John, Minister John, and he got into a um, <laughs> he got into a dialogue with my grandmother, whose Bible I still have, about being sinless. And he told her, basically, that he was without sin. And she told him that nobody is without sin. In no uncertain terms, he told him, no one is without sin. What kind of response? Oh, he was very indignant. Until it come to find out that he was in sin. Because my best friend, Billy, who became a uh, disciple of Reverend Jones, came up pregnant. So everybody knew it wasn't Billy's father because Billy's father wasn't around at the time it was happening. Reverend Jones was. So the whole neighborhood looked at Reverend Jones, <laughs> yes, and Reverend Jones wound up leaving under the cover of cloak of darkness one night. <laughs> anyway, the Holy Spirit will let us know in no uncertain terms where we stand. Nobody who's in under the influence of the Holy Spirit will ever become proud, arrogant, or think of themselves as an authority. Because the Holy Spirit, in a hot minute, will quicken us. Hey, you're stepping out of place. You're putting yourself in the position of God. You are just a vessel. 
And if a person does do that, then they're not under the influence of the Holy Spirit. They're totally under their own carnality, worldly influence. So we see the Holy Spirit gives us the knowledge of God about ourselves. We see ourselves as we really are. He says, let, not, let no man think of himself more highly than he should. We are to understand that we are but vessels saved only by the grace of God. Let's go on. First Corinthians, third chapter, verse 16. First Corinthians, third chapter, verse 16. Uh, 16 and 17. Know you not, the word again, understand, perceive. Do you perceive? Do you understand that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. The temple of God is holy, which temple ye so we are to hold our bodies in a state of sanctity. In other words, being set apart for God, God's service. We're not to defile our bodies with alien substances, cigarettes, alcohol, things that destroy the temple, because if we do, God will destroy us. That's scriptural. Again, the Holy Spirit will quicken us. Gluttony, um, debauchery, things that make us basically um, damage our testimony in the sight of God. When that's done, when a person does that, then they are not under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They are walking in carnality. And I see things that are taking place now. It's amazing. Absolutely. The, the apostate condition of the church is becoming more and more egregious. Things that Christians are doing becoming more and more of a detestation in the sight of God. And basically... Christians are reaching the stage where they don't feel any conviction whatsoever in doing these things. We, we are to speak in love. God will give you the words to say. He'll give you the time to say it. We don't do it from a carnal perspective, judgmentally. What we do is from a relational perspective. If the person is a Christian and you see that happening, God will open the door in which you can come into that person confidently and speak to them wisdom, letting them know that what they're doing is, number one, not right in the sight of God, number two, self-destructive. Then they're left with the decision. They can either abide by the word that's been spoken, or they can go on about their merry way, but God will hold them responsible for what they're doing. Yes. When I was born, I ate for bread against my brother, and I was in fact on his friend now. I was taking care of him. He was a chain smoker, and he popped pills more than any home food. I'm not holding that against him, and I didn't, and I deserved it. Mm -hmm. But he had the nerve to tell me I shouldn't be poor. Okay? <laughs> Yeah, really, really, what I shouldn't be eating pork. Oh. <laughs> the Bible tells me that I shouldn't be, I was just out of my job, okay? Is it right for me to say you're right 
But you shouldn't smoke cigarettes, or should I just go home? Maybe just leave them alone. Because I don't want to make it appear as judgment, but I don't feel like the pot should call the kettle black. Use wisdom. Many times there's a spirit behind this statement. And it's not done to benefit you. He's not telling you you should do this because it's beneficial. He's telling you in an adversarial way to beat you down, make you feel guilty, put you on a guilt trip, and that sort of thing. Oh, I had some post-doctor. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, nothing wrong with that. No, nothing that's, wrong with that. that's awesome. Yeah, you, you smoke it. You the scripture, the scripture says that you tell me what I should do? the scripture says that everything that God has made is beneficial. Danny, can you turn the light on back here? Yeah, exactly. But you have to use wisdom because <clears throat> number one is the person open to objective reasoning. Then, then you're casting your pearls before a swine. You so have to use wisdom. Well, no, but you use <laughs> wisdom. You speak to him at the right time and in the right way. God will lead. The scripture tells us in Mark about the 14th chapter, I'll give you that which you speak. But if you do it in love, you do it in wisdom. Sure. You don't do it in such a way that the person is not going to receive it. Because that mindset of him accusing you of telling you what you shouldn't do is not, he's not speaking to you, number one, in wisdom or in love. He's speaking to you foolishly. So you don't respond on his level. You respond in wisdom at the time and the place that the Holy Spirit will give you. Because what you want to do is you want to speak to him in a way in which he'll receive it beneficially. But if he's not in the mindset at the time, then you're wasting your you're wasting your breath. <laughs> well, he's doing he's doing the job on himself. He doesn't need help. Is he supposed to be a Christian? According to him, he is. No, he be, but the thing is, by me having been to what past him now because I did go in the office and tell him I I couldn't do it. And cut it off. But while I was there, I had to drive out and buy his uh, KFC chicken or his, uh, I think, Mishinoi or something like that to eat. But when I get back to where he lives, he's sitting there puffing, you know, <laughs> and having a Jones because, oh, I don't have my pills and whatever. Well. Yeah. Well, you know, you, 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 you deal with it from the perspective of wisdom. Don't come down to that level, see it for what it is, and you pick your own battles. You speak at the right time and in the right way. God will lead you. Yes? Since we're talking on this topic, let me ask a question. Am I responsible to be my brother's keeper? Is he that one about it? Right? Okay. If that is the case, they call themselves Christian, but they smoke weed, yep. and do what you would not consider as a Christian thing to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was held accountable for his good behavior because John... Of course not. John is always preaching to people about everything. Mm -hmm. It's like again, you have I to use wisdom. It, but you have to use wisdom. God holds them responsible for the decisions that they make. If you name the name of Christ, number one, you're putting yourself in a position of responsibility to God. That's going to hold you responsible for what you claim to be. And number two, you don't take upon yourself. A, a, a load, a burden that's not yours to carry. Thank you. <laughs> They're adults. They have their own decision making mechanism. All you're supposed to do is to speak in love and then they make the decision. Jesus didn't chase down anybody 
to make to force them to do God's will. He just spoke and then he went on because the Holy Spirit was taking them somewhere else to speak. But that's the mindset we have. We can save nobody. All we can do is speak what God has given us to speak and then God is going to take us elsewhere. We don't have the time for frivolous pursuit. Yes. Yeah. About love. So you, all of you thinking about love is, I love you, but you want to hear it back. You know, we need to hear that back. So we say, I love you. We say, I love you, and then we don't hear it back. A lot of times we get kind of scared of the earth. In attitude. Love does not seek to be alone. In other words, if you love somebody, it doesn't matter how they treat you, it doesn't matter how they respond or if they That's respond, right. you love them anyway. That's the love of Christ. That's, That's right. so easy. Yes, but people have a misconception about love. Right. They equate love with weakness, with pointing. And I look at it this way. The first one that fell was Lucifer. And I used to wonder, what in the world would enable this preacher, after all that God did for him and to him and made him one of the most beautiful creatures in the creation, to suddenly pull what he pulled. And the idea that I, that I received, and I believe it was the Holy Spirit, was that he only saw one side of God. He saw the love side. And he reached the stage in his own distorted thinking and he took God for a mamby-pamby weakling who could only love and wouldn't do anything else. So he took advantage to the point where he found out that God is also a judge. But he found out too late. And <laughs> he's still undergoing the result of it. Yeah. The straight and narrow, so I don't have time to be trying to check other people. Number one. And number two was in the last couple of years, I was in a service of the evangelist who calls me out in front of everybody and said, You shouldn't be wearing those rings. And what I want to say is, my initial reaction was shame because it was in front of everybody or embarrassment. Well, what I did with that is I prayed about the ring, but I also, and I'm talking to me, I'm not talking to you, I also started praying for everything that I got and asking the Lord if I'm supposed to have it in my home. So my initial reaction was, oh no, he didn't. And then it went to, I should be praying about everything that I purchased, everything that I own, because the Lord knows. So was he right? I don't know, but that's where it led to. So I didn't get stuck there. But 20 years ago, that would have ran me out like church folks. You're always up in your business. Right? <laughs> so it increased your prayer life. Yeah, it did. Well, what you did was you took a negative and you made a positive out of that. But it was not his prerogative to do what he did. In front of, that was the part. I, I just felt oh, like he could have pulled me aside. Yeah, that was, that was not. Christian love. Yeah. Uh, and then unfortunately, that happens too often. People have been basically browbeat where they would leave a church and hold a grudge against Christians in general because of things that have happened. Anyway, let's go on. Our time is almost up. But the Holy Spirit will quicken you consistently with the knowledge of God about life in general if we're open to receive it. 2 Corinthians, 5th chapter, verse 1. Yes. Well, we know, we understand, that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have the building of God and house not made with hand, eternal in the heavens. Now, what the scripture teaches is that you are a new creation in Christ. You literally are a new being. God has created you, and the easiest 
example of what's happening in our transit would be that of the caterpillar and the butterfly. It's exactly what's happening in us. is a transformation taking place. There's a new creation that actually exists called the new creation spirit man. And as you allow the new creation within you to grow, mature, through the wisdom that comes from God, you will perceive, you will understand on a greater and greater scale the things of the spirit reality, the things of eternity. Because your new creation, the new you, is being prepared for life in heaven. The old you, the scripture tells us, is dying. And when you leave this life, Psalms, about uh, Psalms 146, verse 4, tells us, when the breath leaves a man, that very same day his thoughts perish. So all the things of earth come to a conclusion, and you no longer function that way. An unsaved person who goes into eternity no longer functions as he did in life. That part of him that existed no longer exists. The body is gone, the spirit is gone, all that's left is the soul in the torment regions of eternity with a memory of the things that he did in life. He never pursues anything else. He never is able to conceive, plan, hope, joy, or experience the things he did in life. The ability to do that no longer exists. For the saint, the new creation, the butterfly, takes flight into the regions prepared for him by the Father, from eternity. This is what Paul is saying. As you are open to the Holy Spirit's influence, you become more and more aware of the butterfly developing within you. Danny, you have had dreams of being in other realities, functioning in other ways, but your spirit man giving you understanding of the reality for which was created. Just and thinking about the dream last night, just thinking about the dream I had last night, I was going to share with you after when you said that. That's amazing. <clears throat> so what we find, we know, we conceive, we understand that we have a place waiting for us when we depart this life. Your spirit man, in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, will give you insights into the things of eternity and the spirit world. But... This brings us to the next phase, and I want this before we sink in, if nothing else sinks in. Scripture teaches the knowledge of God is neutralized in the mind that's focused on carnal influences of life. The knowledge of God is not allowed to grow, not allowed to take root, if the mind is focused on the things of life, the cares, the concerns, the pursuits to the exclusion of the things of the Spirit. And we see some examples of this. Turn to Matthew, 13th chapter, verse 20 to 22. We'll be closing with this. Matthew 13, verses 20 to 24. Jesus here speaking about the parable of the sower, which is in essence the word of God, which leads to the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God Rightly applied leads to the wisdom of God. Matthew 13, verse 20 to 22. But he that received the seed into stony places, that is, the stony places represent places where the word is not able to take root in the life. In other words, it's a life it does not put the word into operation. So therefore, it is not benefiting from the principle that it has received. 
He that receiveth the seed in the stony place is the same as he that heareth the word, and unknown with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by he is offended. This is an individual that did not put the word into operation. He heard it, he understood it, but he didn't use it. So, he wasn't prepared for trials or tribulations. The Lord will take a person for, for a time and bless them, bless them, bless them. And they'll take that as, well, this is Christianity. You know? This is a fluffy cloud experience. This is all I need. And all of a sudden, he'll run dead into the, the, the uh, obstacles in the road. He'll hit the reef at full speed. He'll hit the wall and become offended. Well, if this is all Christianity is, I don't want no part of it. He had a false sense of what Christianity was from the beginning. The individual is expected to take the word of God and to apply the word of God so that he can grow in the word of God. This person didn't, so it didn't benefit him. So. That's like a lot of people you speak to, too. Yeah. Richard? They know, but they don't give what? I'm not held accountable for making sure. Because I see a lot of Christians doing not right things. And if I take it upon myself to make sure I correct them like John does, <laughs> he corrects everybody. But anyway, um, so he is pretty much shunned and by a lot of people. And they don't, you know. Who are you to tell me what you well, that, that's Well, that's not your job. So, so I'm not held accountable. No. I could take it upon no. myself. Don't Neither know. is John. It's not John's job. Okay. You have to use wisdom. You speak the word, you speak truth, and then it's for the person to make the decision. You can't save anybody anyway. You can't prevent somebody from taking a fall. If that's what they want to do, that's what they're going to do. You can't save your parents. You can't save your friends. All you can do is speak truth, and it's up to them. God holds them responsible for what they've heard. Is it my fault because I don't know how to speak it rightly? They understand what you have said to. It's not a question you haven't spoken rightly. They know exactly what you have said. They have cho chosen not to abide by what you have said, so that's it. Go on to somebody else. There's a Seven billion people on the face of the earth. There are people out there that haven't heard that would, if they did hear, they would respond. Let's go on. That's why I always take them out to eat, because that way they can just enjoy the meal. <laughs> well, that's what you choose to do. Anyway, verse 22, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and become unfruitful. This is a person who never gets his eyes off of the physical, off of the carnal. One problem after another. One crisis after another. Why? Because he sees things from a carnal perspective. And he never enters into the spiritual reality of what he has been given. He sees things superficially and his dependence is on the physical never the spiritual because he never sees past the physical why isn't this working out right well because you don't see it from god's perspective it never work out right the way you're looking at it. man sees things totally physically man's mind is not capable of seeing things as they are he only sees things as they appear to be, and he becomes a prisoner of the conditions that he's in. I hear people talking about, they look for deliverance in the strangest ways. There's a guy I was listening to this conversation the other day. Oh, when I hit the lottery, man, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Everything is going to change. Oh, boy, it's really going to be, I know, it, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. I'm going down here and buy another lottery ticket. This may be the thing that will change. And you said to yourself, Lord Jesus, have mercy. 
the people buy into this life, which is an illusion, it's not real. Can I respond to that? Go ahead. I tell you so many of my problems, and you know how you deal with it? You didn't tell me what not to do, or you didn't even advise me of what I should do, you know, spiritually, and all that stuff. You didn't give me a lot of things that I can't comprehend anyway. So all you did was quote scripture to me <laughs> and let me muse on it let, and let the Lord speak to me. And I would go home and I would meditate on why is he telling me that? <laughs> really, you, you know, so I just get sick and tired. I know he's going to quote me none of the scriptures. <laughs> so <laughs> let's not even bother. <laughs> but, no, but you do. You, you give me the, you quote me the scripture and the Lord ministered to me as to what I should do and shouldn't do, right? Yep. Great That's counselor it. you are. <laughs> no, the Lord is. He's the one that we look and he's the one who will lead us and guide us directly to the throne of God. Okay, so what we find here, looking at this, the person whose focus cannot go beyond the physical is going to be a slave to the physical. We are to realize ourselves, see ourselves as God sees us. We are to perceive things from God's perspective, not from man's perspective. Closing, turn to Isaiah 55, verse 9. Isaiah 55, verse 9. We are to take upon ourselves the mind of God in Christ. Isaiah 55, verse 9. Says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God will impart his thoughts to us through the Holy Spirit and his ways to us through the Holy Spirit. It will take you into a high plateau of existence, put you on a level in which you see your life from an eternal, not a physical, carnal perspective, an eternal perspective, you see an overview of your life. You see your past, your present, and your future. Not from a human perspective where everything looks insurmountable and you're going from one day to the next day trying to make it. No, God will elevate you to that position where you get an overview of your life and he will give you direction and guidance. Understand, what you do today is going to affect what you're going to be doing 10,000 years from now, a million years from now. See your life from eternal perspective, and you will walk in freedom, walk in liberty. You will be above the ability of the enemy to try to influence you because the enemy cannot rise to that height. The enemy basically is successful when he takes a person down to his level. Focus on this. Focus on that. Look at this problem. You're not able to do that. He's always going to focus on a negative perspective. He's always going to focus on something to lead the person that receives that into bondage or fear or depression. God does just the opposite. God will take you to a high degree of elevation in Christ. He will show you as God sees you in overcoming 
son or daughter of God being prepared for life in eternity. and The problems that seem so formidable will seem as totally different. We look at life from a different perspective. The influences that seem to be so formidable wash away. Because all they are are illusions to begin with. Satan's a master illusionist. And his victories come from deceiving people into thinking what is truly an illusion is a reality. It's not. There's no problem any of us ever have or ever will have that's greater than God. So when you run to an obstacle, you run into a problem, a challenge, bring God into the equation. God will always show you the problem, the obstacle, in its true perspective. It will give you the ability to overcome whatever it is.